Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game Imperial Settlers, designed by Ignacy Dechevichek and published by Portal Games. The four world powers were getting along fine until they all started to settle the same new lands. Now things are getting crowded and wars breaking out on all sides, which will be fine for the faction that wins. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place this scoreboard on the table with the round marker on the first space of this track. Within reach of the players, create a general supply of these various pieces representing wood, stone, food, workers, gold, rays, and defense tokens. However, you'll only need as many defense tokens as the number of players, and since I'm setting up for a two-player game in this video, I'll return these to the box. Also, to make it easier for me to set up the various shots in this video, I'm just going to keep all of these pieces off to the side and off screen, but do keep in mind they're here and I'll pull them into view as necessary. The cards with this back are called common locations, and they should be shuffled into a face-down deck and placed within easy reach. Each player now chooses one of the four factions and takes its matching board, which they'll place in front of themselves. They recommend using the Roman and Barbarian factions for your first few games, so that's what we'll do here. Now collect the cards that show a symbol here that matches your faction, and place them face down near you. Each player also puts their faction marker on the zero space of the victory point track right here. If a player has the Egyptian faction, they also collect these tokens. Now choose a player to receive the first player marker, and starting with them and going clockwise around the table, each player draws two cards from the common deck, and two from their faction deck to form their starting hand, which they can examine but should keep secret from the other players. And that's the setup. In Imperial Settlers, you'll be working to expand your kingdom, to gain more resources and have more options to grow your kingdom even further so that you have the most victory points at the end of the game. The game is played over five rounds, broken into four phases each, starting with the lookout phase. Here, each player draws one card from the top of their faction deck, so in the first round you'll have five cards total in your hand. Next, have a player draw and place face up as many cards from the common deck as the number of players plus one, so in this two-player game we'll reveal three. Now starting with the first player and going clockwise, each will choose one of these face-up cards to add to their hand, with the remaining card being put into a common discard pile. Now you draw and reveal the same number of cards once again, but this time the last player who chose a card picks first, and then the rest are taken in counterclockwise order, again discarding the final one. Do keep in mind over the course of the game there's no limit to the number of cards a player can have in their hand. Now it's time for the production phase where players will collect goods. Starting with the first player and going clockwise, gain the resources listed here under production on your faction board. For example, these symbols tell the Roman player to collect two workers, one raise and one defense token, one wood and one stone. Later in the game, a player may have some cards tucked here underneath the top of their faction board, with symbols exposed on top. During production, you will also collect the resources showing there, like this one, which is food, and this, which is a coin. Finally, as we'll see later, you may have built locations which show this keyword, production. If any show a symbol next to that keyword, you also gain those items now. For example, this one means that the player draws a new card from either their faction or the common deck. They get to choose. However, in some cases, the icon will include a restriction. For this production, the player has to draw from the common deck. Resources in the game are meant to be unlimited, so if any run out, perhaps because one player is hoarding them, you can use these multiplier tokens to return some to the supply. For example, if I had these five stones, I could keep one, putting it on this token and returning the rest to the supply for the player who needs them. This token now reminds me that this one stone is actually worth five of them. Now it's time for the action phase. Starting with the first player and then going clockwise around and around the table, players will take turns performing one of the five available actions or passing. However, if you pass, you can no longer take actions during that round, but you also can't be targeted by the other players. Once all the players have passed, the action phase is over. So right now, let's learn the five different actions you can take. Building a location is an action that lets a player add a structure to their empire by choosing a card from their hand and paying the cost as shown here in the upper left hand corner, returning those goods from their collection to the general supply. Note that if a player has a gold coin token, each can be spent in place of a single wood, stone, or food cost. Some costs will also show this house icon. That represents a location. 
And it means that to build this structure, in addition to spending the other resources shown, you must also discard one of your previously built locations. As usual, discarded common cards go into a common discard pile shared by all the players. But when discarding one of your own faction buildings, put that in a discard pile beside your faction deck. Once a building has been paid for, you need to place it in the correct location. Common structures will always go on the right of your faction board, and faction buildings will always go on the left. Your empire is also made up of three rows, production, feature, and action, which are shown here on your board. Each structure will tell you which row it belongs to in the italic text found here at the start of their effect. So a faction production building would go here, while this common action location would be placed here. As you place additional buildings in the same row, just put them beside ones that have already been built. When you build a production location, you immediately gain any resources shown here after the production keyword. In this case, the player would gain one stone from the general supply. They will also gain those resources during each production phase in future rounds, as we saw earlier. If a location shows a building bonus, you gain that as well, but only once at the time the location is played. Feature locations like this one have special abilities that are active during each of that player's turns. For example, this administration building says that each time you build a Roman location, you gain either one gold coin or this symbol, which represents one victory point. Anytime you would gain victory points, advance your faction score marker, that number of spaces, on the victory point track. Each of the locations in the game have their own special abilities that are explained directly on the cards themselves. So rather than go through each individual cards, by the end of this video, you should be able to read and understand how these work. However, if you do encounter any effects you don't quite understand, you can always check the reference found here in the rulebook. One thing I would like to mention is that if a feature or production location would give you a benefit based on how many of certain other types of locations you have, you include the location providing the benefit in those numbers if it applies. So on a feature like this one, since it is a Roman building, you would gain this benefit as you build the administrative location itself. The other type of location are action locations, which provide you with new actions that you can take on your turn. And since these are actions, like all others we've been discussing, performing one takes up your entire turn. So as an example, a player on their turn with this structure already in play could pay the goods cost that will be indicated with the action, placing them directly on top of that location. This will remind you that the action has been used this round and may not be used again unless otherwise indicated. Now the player resolves the listed effect. In this case, they were able to gain two victory points. Sometimes a location action can be used more than once. For example, this one tells us that it may be activated twice. So we could pay once for its effect, gaining a stone, and then on a future turn, pay another worker to gain another stone. Or you also have the option of paying the cost twice in a single action and resolving its effect twice. So in this case, immediately gaining those two stone in one action where you would pay two workers. I should mention some effects like this one are based on the color of the buildings in your empire, which is shown by the colored band right here. This effect says that we will produce one wood for each brown location in our empire up to a maximum of three. Keep in mind, this again means that you'll count this building itself when resolving its effect, since it is also brown. As you can see, there's a variety of different colors the locations can come in, so this is another thing to consider when you're choosing which buildings to add to your empire. Another action a player can take on their turn is called making a deal. To do this, you spend one food token, and then you choose a faction card from your hand, flip it upside down, and slip it under the top of your faction board so that the symbol here is still visible. You then gain that resource right away and also in each future production phase. And there's no limit to the number of deals any one player can have underneath of their faction board. Another action is raising, and there's two different ways to do it. One is choosing a common card from your hand, and that's important, it needs to come from your hand, it can't be one you already have in play. And then you pay one raise token. You then collect the resources shown here. In this case, a gold and a worker. That location is then discarded. The other way to raise is by choosing an opponent's common location that's currently in play. And this is important, it needs to be a common location. You cannot raise their faction locations. You then pay two raise tokens and take from the general supply the goods that are showing in the raise area of the location that you targeted. You then flip that location over 
and the targeted player gains one wood token from the supply. You can maybe think of this as what they managed to salvage from your destruction. This flipped location is known as a foundation, and although it lost its original abilities, it's not useless to the player stuck with it. It can be discarded to pay for a house icon on a location that you're building in a future turn. And you're reminded of that by the house icon shown here. Before moving on, I should mention this defense token. At any moment during a player's turn in the action phase, they can place it on one common location they already have built. Doing this doesn't use up their action for that turn. But now, if a player wants to raise that location, they need to spend an extra raise token. So in this case, the Barbarian player would need to spend three swords. Defense tokens once placed cannot be moved, and when a location is raised that had a defense token, it is also returned to the supply. Another action you can take is returning two workers to the supply to gain either a single wood, stone, food, or to draw a common or faction card. In a single action, you can spend multiple pairs of workers to claim the same or different benefits as you like. In this case, I spent four workers, so I might choose to collect a wood and draw a faction card. You'll find a reminder of this action and how it works here at the bottom of your faction board. And those are all the actions to choose from. Once everyone is passed, you then move on to the cleanup phase. First, each player checks the feature here on their board. It will let you store a certain resource, meaning you can keep any number of it that you didn't spend during the previous round. But otherwise, you return to the supply all other resources that you had produced, but didn't use. Also return your defense tokens, even if they're currently sitting on a location, and any goods used for actions. Cards you have in hand are never discarded and will carry over into the next round. Now pass the first player token to the next player in clockwise order, move the round marker to the next space on the track, and then begin the next round repeating the four phases. Before moving on, there are a couple of quick rules I should mention. First of all, your resources, workers, and tokens should always be clearly visible to all the players. If you ever run out of cards in the common deck, reshuffle its discard pile into a new face down one to draw from. However, if you run out of cards in your faction deck, it is not reshuffled. You simply won't be able to draw from that deck anymore. Finally, these symbols here will tell you how many copies of that location are found in your faction deck. So the Romans have a possibility of drawing up to three administration buildings. At the end of the action phase of the fifth and final round, the game is over. You don't need to complete the cleanup phase. Instead, you can move on to final scoring. You do this by adding to your current score one victory point for every common location you've built and two for every faction location. You're reminded of this by the stars shown here on each location. If a player has the Japanese faction, they may also have some locations, like this one, that also provide extra victory points at the end of the game. The player with the most points wins. Now, if there's a tie, the tied player with the most remaining workers and resources wins. Keep in mind, resources only include food, wood, and stone tokens. If there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most cards remaining in their hand wins. And if they're still tied, those tied players share the victory. Before wrapping up, I'd like to point out that the Japanese faction has some special rules. First, unlike other factions, you can target and raise Japanese faction locations, paying two raise tokens as normal, and then the building is immediately discarded. The Japanese player does not gain it as a foundation or collect a wood token. However, during the Japanese player's turn, they can also deploy any number of workers as samurai to locations in their empire. No location can have more than one samurai, and they cannot be moved once placed, unless the location is raised, in which case they are returned to the general supply. Buildings with a samurai now require an extra raise token in order to target it. And that's everything you need to know to play Imperial Settlers. Now the game does include some variants, as well as these 16 battle cards so that you can play the game solo, but I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. If you do have any questions about anything you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.